So welcome, thank you for coming. Today I will tell you what I learned about transparency in teaching and how I apply this concept and its main principles in my courses. Uh, feel free to modify whatever you see here today, the way it fits your courses. So this is not just a one-way um, concept. You can be as flexible about it as, um, as you want to. So um, about two years ago, I attended a workshop led by Marianne Wilkelmus. And she talked about transparency and the importance of transparency there in that one hour workshop. Um, she, you can actually read about her uh, entire research here. Once you receive the slideshow, um, anything that's underlined is uh, probably a hyperlink that takes you to your website with additional information. So she said that they started this project because um, they found that in community colleges there were a lot of um, students, especially from the <coughs> underrepresented uh, student cohorts who were dropping out more than um, the other students. and. They were trying to find ways to increase retention. And so they had two groups of students. One group received assignments the same way they have always been receiving assignments. And the other group of students uh, received, uh, well, the teachers received specific instructions on how to turn their assignments um, into more transparent assignments. And they found that those students who received um, instructions which were more transparent um, actually stayed and didn't drop out and completed those courses more successfully. So they thought, well, if it works for them, we could probably start spreading the word <laughs> and telling everybody to join in uh, and teaching with transparency. And so when you can see these links right here, they will take you to, for instance, this one will explain the method itself in details. And, um, and here you can see examples because it works uh, across you know, all sorts of disciplines. So you can see what it looks like in biology, sociology, uh, political science, and so on. And let me just play this clip from Marianne Wilkelmus where she explains why she felt that the transparency was needed. See it in college. There are rules that we know about and rules that as an entering new college student, we may not know. Things like, what does a good lab report look like when it's finished? What does a good comparison study look like? What's involved in writing a research paper? These are things that many students coming into college have never done before. And they consist of complicated sets of skills that students may never have used in that exact combination inside of that discipline before. So if students don't have a good example of what these things look like, then they're not privy to those unwritten rules about how to succeed. All right, so as I said, I attended um, her workshop and what she asked us to do is to bring in an assignment, something recent that we just assigned and let's put the assignment through the transparency test. And um, because there were a little bit less than 100 attendees, we were working in groups and we were looking at each other's assignments based on the main principles of transparency. And the main principles that I will talk about today is the purpose statement of every assignment, detailed directions, and the form of or forms of assessment. And I have to say that I did very well on the instructions and the assessment, but I realized that I had zero purpose statement in my assignment, so I didn't actually tell the students why they were completing that assignment. And I mean, technically in the classroom, I told them, hey, this is what we've done so far, so now let's put all that practice into writing. But once I handed out the written assignment, that section was, was not part of my assignment. And so this is something that 
we do like if you teach an online class you know that the purpose statement is part of the deal because you know there is no time to talk to the students because your um, communication is via the online platform but in a face-to-face -face class you just assume well I told them so they know and that's not necessarily true because they might be doing something else on their laptops or on their phones while you're <laughs> explaining the why or answering the why question um, and so let me just play another brief clip from Marianne Wilkomas. When we ask teachers to be a little more transparent about academic work, all we ask them to do is to discuss with students ahead of time, before the students do the work, three aspects of the work. The purpose, the task, and the criteria. The purpose has two parts, really. What skills will the students practice from doing this assignment? And what knowledge will they gain from working on this particular assignment? And we ask the teachers to talk with students not just about the skills and the knowledge as they pertain to that one assignment, but how does that set of skills and that piece of knowledge relate to the students' real lives? And so in my um, academic writing class, and let me just tell you that I teach uh, undergraduate students and graduate students in the English Language Training Academy at SPECS. So we're preparing them to enter uh, the mainstream, mainstream classes. Um, so I started providing them with the purpose and we talk about every single statement there. Uh, so these are the skills that I, <clears throat> I need you to, um, to practice. And one of the reasons why it's important, for instance, in our department is that most students have this false assumption that the only thing I'm looking at is their grammar or their grammar and their vocabulary. And I tell them, no, I'm looking at a lot more. I'm expecting you to show me all of this. Um, and so, you know, having discussed what the expectations are, they already sort of know what I will be assessing. So not just what, why they are completing something, but what I will be looking at as they are um, completing the assignment. And let me show you where I get these learning goals and objectives. So this is an image of um, the course goals from my syllabus. And I know that some syllabus will have really, really detailed learning goals or um, course goals or learning outcomes, whatever you, um, you word them. Others will probably have um, less detailed version of what you see here. Um, so what I do is every time I put together an assignment, I use this as the menu. So. I will start selecting the, um, the objectives from what's in my syllabus already. Uh, and sometimes I modify, for instance, here, um, course goals uh, under reading and note-taking skills. It says, understand the importance of effective note-taking to succeed on exams. So for, um, for certain assignments, I will say, um, practice effective note-taking with um, or using Cornell-style notes so that it's more specific to that assignment. And I would say that if you don't have such detailed uh, course objectives or learning objectives for your, uh, for your course, it's probably good to sit down with um, your colleagues and come up with a long list, a detailed list, because it really, really helps you as you put together the assignment and especially the purpose uh, statement. So it's, um, it's an easy way. At ELTA, this is what we did. Um, one of the lead instructors sat down with, um, with all the instructors and said, okay, what is it exactly that you guys are doing uh, in every single course? So then she came up with this long list and detailed list. Um, what I did in order to see across the department, I put together a map. And so this is just our department again in ELTA, because I thought that once we have these detailed um, learning objectives or learning outcomes, we can probably at one point start adding certain assignments to it. So we can be transparent 
across our department as well. So how do we get to that learning outcome? How do we achieve it with what type of um, assignments? And um, let me just show you the map itself. It's not an official map. This is something that I started working on, frankly, because I just wanted to see what sets of skills will my students bring with them when they come to my class and what comes next so what should i give them in order to move um, move on and join the next uh, level so for instance um, this semester i'm teaching academic writing it's one of the classes and um, and so these are the four categories to which i put these um, learning objectives and what I do is that I'm looking at this class right here because this is the writing class that they take before they come to my class. So I will take a look at, okay, what kind of reading comprehension and note taking are they doing there? And then I can see what I'm doing. So I can tell students, oh, I know <laughs> what you did last semester. And, and I think it, it helps to remind them that you know what they have done because you can even say now, you know, go back to your notes and review what your instructor told you because, you know, it should, you should still remember, you know, don't just throw that notebook away. Or as you're teaching them um, a new set of skills, well, you know, next semester when you move to the higher level, then you will be expected to build upon this particular skill. And so I think it helps or it keeps them uh, checked that you know what happened and you know what will happen next so um, you know that you can keep them more engaged and on their toes um, and as I said ideally at one point we will have um, in this map uh, a link to each learning outcome and we will add one at least one or several assignments, how to reach that learning outcome. And so, for instance, this is an example of uh, the Cornell Stan note-taking practice when I asked students to analyze a scholarly journal article or any article. And so here's the purpose statement so that they know why they are doing this and the detailed directions and the assessment and I also give them a template because you never know. And so this is just an example. And as I said, hopefully once in the near future, this will be all full of uh, great assignments. But let me just come back to the slides right here. And so besides providing a nice purpose statement, the next section is telling the students how. And let me just play this other short clip. The next thing we ask teachers and students to talk about ahead of time, before the students start doing any work, is the task. That's fairly simple. It's just what do the teachers expect students to do and how should they do it? And to provide some direction about this helps students produce higher quality work because they waste less time figuring out how instead focusing on the task at hand? Um, I used to give students uh, instructions in a form of a sort of a paragraph telling them okay so this is what we've done before and now this is what we're going to do next and and they always so so what, do, what exactly do you want us to do <laughs> and so I don't do that anymore now everything is numbered or bullet pointed and I started adding images, video tutorials, everything that helps them sort of visualize uh, the assignment itself. And, um, and I've heard from, especially in that workshop that I attended, there were some instructors who said, oh, that's spoon feeding, you know, they should see and read between the lines and, and understand everything. But that's the point that, you know, students don't necessarily and uh, because I'm in a special position that I'm teaching ESL students who could be completely new to the entire system that we're using here, Blackboard or Google or anything, they do need all the extra help so that they can successfully complete uh, um, an assignment. 
Um, just a few examples of what transparent uh, directions might look like. I, um, I edit some examples from my courses. And for example, this one, I broke um, the source integration practice into certain chunks because this is such a complex skill to master um, source integration where you quote but we want to introduce it and you want to explain what you just quoted or paraphrased or summarized or just the in-text citation just so students don't understand it if you just suddenly throw the assignment at them but if you if you approach it in small chunks they can actually get there and complete it successfully and so you know this is just one um, one way when I ask them to watch video tutorials and then create checklists based on that um, and of course then we have the activities everything is you know colored <laughs> so um, we can we can always identify certain parts of um, a quote sandwich, let's say, and just to make it nice and you know visually appealing. So yeah, so this is you know breaking in that, breaking the assignment down into smaller chunks, uh, modeling the assignment itself. I have to say that when I started modeling source synthesis. Um, I mean, I knew that it wasn't easy, an easy task, but when you do it and you show them how you're doing it, that's just, you know, excruciatingly difficult because that's when you realize, oh yeah, this is, yeah, you guys need like a week or two to complete this task because it, it took me a long time to, you know, to get there and technically I'm supposed to be the expert. Um, and, and I show them exactly how to, these are the sources that I, you know, I read, then I, the highlighted sources, the ones that I picked out, and I showed them how I created the matrix itself, and then how I turned that synthesis matrix into a map, and that's just, you know, breaking down uh, step by step. Um, I forgot to add the video that I also created in which I'm explaining students how to do this. And I think it's two 10 minute videos, something like that. Um, the good thing about doing this, although it's time consuming, um, it really reduces the, the office hours or the visits during your office hours because students will know, like, oh, okay. And I tell them, here's the video, watch it. There's a pause button, because sometimes I have students who say, but it's so long, and we'll talk about 10 minutes. <laughs> like, well, there's the pause and click, <laughs> and then, and I said, you know, treat this as a YouTube tutorial on how to make scrambled eggs, you know, pause and then stir and then continue. And so I think that, you know, that helps if you, <laughs> if you um, explain it that way. Um, providing, for instance, in my case, sample essays. They don't know what a rhetorical analysis is, so this is what it looks like. And I tell them this paper is 100%. So this is an A paper. And I also show them, not just the A papers, I show them the 50% paper. Like, see, I gave this student 50%. And so we talk about why, you know, certain assignments didn't get 100%. Um, and so they have something to compare uh, their work to. And it really didn't take me that long to compile this. I just had to um, talk to my students that I taught before, like, hey, can I use your paper? And of course, yes. Yes. Well, I didn't tell her that I was going <laughs> to, <laughs> and there are no names, yes. so, but she was like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm like, okay, thank you, so I got the permission. Um, if I ask them to create videos, then I ask, again, students who have done videos before, and just, you know, can I use the example, and they always give you permissions, because it's, you know, just exciting to be asked, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, 
scaffolding in our case we need scaffolding because some of our students are you know quite uh, quite weak but you know why not provide some scaffolded sentences that what you want to see the vocabulary that you want to see and for instance this is a weekly planner I ask students to plan um, the assignments that I'm asking them to complete during the week and they always think that it's totally unnecessary and I let them think that but uh, I want them to give me a planner in which they show me what they are expected to do in my course that week just that week what do you have to read what do you have to watch what do you have to write and complete it um, and surprisingly in this section right here questions and reflections uh, they tend to be really honest not everybody uses that but those who use are like I had no idea how something was so difficult or you know I wasn't expecting to get an A on this assignment and I did so they you know they do give you feedback uh, right there um, providing templates Again, just to answer the how-to question, for instance, the Cornell style note-taking, I give them tutorials, right? So they can actually watch these YouTube tutorials on how to do it, and it's really, really detailed. Um, but without the templates, they still don't necessarily pay attention to each section of, um, of the Cornell uh, notes. Uh, so this way, they're going to have to write down the title and give me the URL or the notes and the keywords and the summary. So there's, you can't skip a section because then it's going to be empty and you're going to feel awkward that you didn't do anything there. Is that required? Is that required as part of Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, every section has to be filled out. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And even in the grading rubric it says, yellow section, green section, blue section. So if something is not there, then we both know it's missing. Um, and so I find that it helps. Although they can become a little bit lazy and towards the end of the semester, do you have a template for that? <laughs> it's like, I do, but you know, let's start. Uh, by the way, about the videos, well, let me just talk about that right here. Um, so I also create, for major assignments and complex assignments, I also create um, roadmaps. I call them roadmaps and I use um, this tool, this online tool called MindMeister. This is a mapping tool. And so for instance, this assignment was about getting familiar with thesis statements, writing thesis statements. Um, I also try to introduce the idea of a flipped classroom so then they would learn about it at home so when they come to class I only have 75 minutes to sit down with them and do some action so I told them okay um, view this map study this map and there are a lot of tutorials and examples hidden in there uh, and of course, you know, starting with the objectives, the purpose, why you're doing this, and, um, you know, smaller chunks, the role of the thesis statement, the characteristics, types, and, um, and then some video tutorials on how to write a thesis statement as, as well. And when they come to the class, I start with a quiz. Okay, so how much did you understand? And they, you know, they, they do very well. Um, I provided a video as well and with in this video I tell them what they can see in the map and um, I can turn this map into a presentation um, and so when I made the video this is what I did so I turned the map into presentation slides and I explained what they can see what they can find so this was um, uh, their homework and like I said in class I quiz them at the beginning of the semester I give them a lot of videos that I provide and I prepare these videos uh, Just explaining what the homework assignments are and again my students um, Are new to blackboard. They are new to Google. They are new to a lot of tools 
So they need all the extra help. And so I literally tell them, this is where you click, this is how you open it, this is how you copy and paste. But towards the, um, right, well, towards the end of the semester after midterm, those videos are not as often because I also want them to, to, un, to be able to transition into their mainstream classes where not everything will be um, explained and broken down into teeny tiny details. And by then they should be able to use Blackboard and, and Google and uh, other tools in the classrooms. So um, there are fewer videos towards the end of the semester. Um, for recording the screen, I use Screencastify because it's, um, it's a handy tool. It's a Google Chrome extension. And um, I ask my students to record their screens and explain certain assignments. For instance, when they do their source synthesis, they have to explain how they group their sources and how those sources are connected. Or if they have to create an essay outline, they have to make a video and explain their outline and their approach towards um, that particular essay type. Um, and right after midterm, I just ask students, okay, where do you learn about using Screencastify? And by then they say YouTube. So they, by then they know everything goes through YouTube and there are the tutorials. So again, you know, they, they've learned that um, in the first, I don't know, eight to 10 weeks. So we're getting to the third part of uh, transparency, and that's the assessment. So let me play the final clip from her. The last thing we want teachers and students to talk about explicitly together before the students start working is criteria. We ask for teachers and students to come up with some sort of a checklist of expectations. But that's not enough. In addition to that, we want our students to see examples of what work looks like when it meets those expectations and sometimes when it doesn't. Right, so um, just let me start with the final statement. Those are the simple essays that I normally uh, provide so that they know what it looks like when it's an A or when it's not quite there yet. Um, let me just, I will talk about checklists and grading rubrics, but let me just um, highlight the importance of Blackboard Respondus Lockdown Browser. I don't know if many of you have used it before. I also consider this as part of the transparency business um, because uh, students um, don't always understand that when you have 25 tabs open on your laptop, you're really not focusing. Um, and so when they have to do some in-class work, this is what I use. So I, I have them um, go to Blackboard through the lockdown browser and literally what it does, it locks down all the other browsers and so they have to focus on the assignment no matter what. And of course, they don't always like the idea, but I tell them it's for you so that you can focus better and this is for your benefit. Um, and also, it's, um, you know, being on the same page. Nobody, you know, there are some students who are good at browsing and looking for information and working on the assignment at the same time or, you know, completing the assignment while looking for information. And I'm not talking about cheating, it's just completing the task itself. Other students are not very good at that. So I just give everybody the same amount of information and there you go, start working. Um, so we are on the same page doing that. But let me just go back to um, the assessment and checklists. This is what a grading rubric looks like in, uh, in my class. Uh, the rubrics are normally colorful and the students um, know that blue is always for vocabulary and the words and green is grammar and, and so on. Um, also, it's, I find that it's probably a little bit easier to read if you add colors to it. So then it's not just a big chunk of white and, 
and black uh, texts. I tell students that a grading rubric is your checklist and this is for me to give you feedback. So it goes both ways. They have to look at the rubric before they start working on the assignment. And I often ask them, okay, look at the rubric, now prepare a checklist. Give me a checklist. And of course, you know, if you're tricky, you're just, you know, copying and pasting, but there are some who just paraphrase and make it shorter. Um, I put the possible points here and then once I give them feedback, um, because I, re, you know, I use the, the color red for concern, then I'll just put the red here and then proficiency is in green. So they can, they can definitely see if it's more green or if it's more red once they receive my feedback. So if you see more red, it's probably not good news. And if it's more green, then it's yay. Um, based on what they see there, they have to revise their work. I always give 10% for revision. So it's, it's enough incentives to actually do the revision, but it's not gonna turn um, a D grade into an A minus. So it's, there's, uh, there's a difference. Um, sometimes I provide rubrics with, uh, with a lot of hyperlinks in them. So if I say, make sure that you use voice markers, then once they click on voice markers, they go to that website and they see what I mean by voice markers. And they just use that as, uh, as an important um, resource. Or if I say, you know, signal words, have a variety of signal words, again, they can just click on that and see what I mean by that. Uh, sometimes I have YouTube clips or tutorials. Okay, what is an annotated bibliography? Oh, not that one, sorry. <laughs> Here. And, um, and they, can, they can see it, again, just getting the information before um, they do the task. Uh, for instance, in this case, for the annotated bibliography, uh, I use different colors and I ask them to highlight those sections in their annotated bibliographies. So when you talk about the ethos or the credibility, highlight it in red. And I want them to be aware what they have produced and it makes grading a lot easier as well. Um, there's also a rubric for participation in, um, in class, and I show them, I, we, we talk about this during the first week of what they are expected to do. Most of the international students tend to be really shy and quiet, and um, so I tell them, well, let's break out of that shell, and so I tell them that this is, you know, this is really what your um, what you're looking at to get the participation points. Um, at the end of the semester, I, if, we, if I have time, I ask students to compose the grading rubric um, together for a, class, uh, for a class assignment, and this is what they did. And they actually did a pretty good job. They, they picked out what I meant for them to, to include. And, uh, and it was a really noisy assignment because, so I, I gave them access to this document and I told them everybody should add at least one um, criterion and you know, don't repeat it two, three times, just once. So if you see that somebody's already typed it, then you know, do something else. And so they, they gave me basically a simplified version of a grading rubric that I normally give them, but they got the idea. They, they knew that they had to have a conclusion, um, you know, not too awkward in the writing or relationship between the ideas. I was really surprised when I saw that, like, yes, I got there. And so, you know, if you have time and you trust the students to come up with a nice grading rubric, once they receive a grading rubric, a detailed grading rubric on a regular basis, they should be able to create one at the end of the semester. 
and I think that's um, uh, that's really you know that that's the feedback that you're looking for. Like they get it, <laughs> they you know they know that there's a reason for using rubrics. Now, um, so what does it look like on Blackboard once you create an assignment with all those components, the purpose, the directions, and the grading? Um, it's actually one long <laughs> assignment, but I had to break it down to two because it wasn't, um, there wasn't enough space. So starting with the purpose, sometimes adding images just to, I don't know, I believe that it just gets their attention, or I hope, and some tutorials on how to use, let's say, the mapping uh, tools. Um, in this assignment, I asked them to explain their outline, so there's a tutorial that I gave them on using Screencastify. Although they know that they have to look on YouTube, Every now and then, um, I have that feeling that they would probably spend about half an hour just looking for the shortest tutorial on YouTube, so I just pick the one that I think will be the most beneficial for them. Normally, um, the official tutorial from um, the service itself, and then there goes the, the grading rubric as well. So if students see this, they should really know why they're doing this how to and how they will be uh, assessed at the end of um, the day. One last thing that I recommend, and uh, as I said before, once I give students the grading rubric, I then ask them to provide a checklist or turn it into a checklist. So for example, with my academic writing students, we are getting to, well, we are actually at um, the final step of the research-based paper. So the essay they are right, that they are writing, so I asked them to think about it. Okay, what have you completed so far? And so we're talking about the project. And technically they should say, and that's what the students told me, they told me they did source evaluation and annotated bibliographies and source synthesis. So they talked about everything or data commentary. What is holding you back? Um, most of my students told me, while well, they realized that they didn't have enough sources or maybe not the most credible sources. So they have to still continue looking. Uh, and then I asked them to create a checklist. We talked about self-efficacy, so I said, okay, you, you need to know if you're ready and you need to know what skills you need and what skills or, um, for instance, if you didn't do very well on the source synthesis that you have to revisit that assignment because without that it's going to be extremely hard to actually write the paper. So I gave them, this is actually a snapshot from, uh, from Blackboard. I use um, the journal tool for them to, uh, to prepare for assignments. And we talked about the images. I asked them, okay, what do you see? What does it mean? So just to help them understand self-efficacy because otherwise they would just run it through their translation tool and call it a day. So we, <laughs> we talked about why it's important. After they receive my uh, feedback for their assignments, um, I give them a rubric. It's called the after test reflection piece. They get a lot of points. Well, like 5% of the test, but at least, you know, some. Um, so they can't get the full score for an assignment without completing this part because I just want them to, to take a look at my feedback and, you know, what did I say? What did I say about your strengths? What did I say about your weaknesses? Um, I asked them sneaky questions like, um, this is what I learned from the tutor at the writing center because they should be scheduling tutoring and I know that most of them don't. So they say, well, I didn't go. Or uh, those who are not um, as brave, they just say NA. <laughs> I'm like, why is it an NA? Um, or just, you know, simply asking them, what were your learning goals? And, um, and the first time when I ask them, they probably say, I don't know. And then I ask them, well, 
what did I tell you on their learning goals or purpose? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, and, you know, honestly, where do you think you can uh, use this new skill? Is there anything that you're still confused about? And we can have a con because I asked them to use Google Docs for their assignments, we can have a nice conversation in the margin. So I ask follow up questions and then they respond. Um, so that they know that, you know, it's not over yet. <laughs> you should still continue thinking about it and working on um, the task itself. So this is on Google Docs, you're saying, or the assignment on both? The assignment is on, yes. This little yes, that's after the grading, right below the grading rubric is this. So it's also on Yes, mm -hmm. yes, 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 exactly. About that communication grading rubric, or the grading rubric for assessing their communication or participation, um, I made participation very, or their weekly effort, extremely transparent. Simply, what I do is um, I ask them to prepare these cards, and these are called the effort passes. And everybody has three. There's uh, the white one, and that's for basic yes/no questions. Just if I say, if I ask a yes/no question, even if you're strong enough to raise your hand and say yes or no, I will collect your white card, and you get a point for it. If I have a more complex or an open-ended question, it's the blue card. And for critical thinking, reflection, so more challenging, it's the red card. And uh, again, my international students tend to be extremely shy and quiet and, you know, I better not say anything attitude. So with this one, I can make, you know, I can turn a quiet class into an noisy one because frankly, they just want to get rid of those passes because they know that that's going to be a lot of points. And they keep tra track of those points. Like, oh, I think that you forgot to give me the three points last time. Or like, okay, sorry. Um, and I collect, um, let me just show you. So I, I collect these um, effort passes. I also ask students to open up a Google document and they put all their assignments during that semester into that one single document. So those, that's what I call their course portfolios. And I have the links to their individual course portfolios. So I can always go and see what's going on and what they're working on. Um, and so I collected their cards and they are funny, like, you know, Jimmy is of course always with the hat and I can identify him. <laughs> it actually really helps learning students' name and faces, just who's who. Um, and so yeah, I print out one sheet that's all white and then blue and, and red. And, um, and once I say, okay, now we're going to have this discussion, so get your effort passes ready, or sometimes I announce it on Blackboard, like tomorrow we're going to discuss this and that, so make sure that you have your effort passes with you. Those who left them at home, they are producing cards in the class in like two seconds so they can, they can earn the points. There will still be a few, you know, a handful of students who will still be reluctant to participate, but not very many. I would say maybe two per class. And I try to ask them, once you use all three, then I try to, then I tell them, okay, no more, you know, you use your card. So now I want to hear from people who still have a few left. And, um, and yeah. And another thing that I don't know about your students, but my students recently, there's a new trend. Everybody thinks that they are an A student and they should be getting an A and you know, how come that they don't get an A and GPAs and oh, there's all kinds of discussions. So just a few days ago, I had a nice long talk with my students and I started asking them questions like, okay, are you still using a translation tool? Yeah, you're not an A student, sorry. Uh, are you still talking to your classmates in my class in your first language when it's clearly I said, you know, let's you, okay, then you're not an A student. So I, I gave them a long list and then they stopped asking me about 
getting an A. Um, and I said, well, you know, frankly, if you're an A student, you should be checking all this. And, and I tell them, you know, you, being a B student is still really, really good. So let's not get too greedy. Or, you know, C is not bad either, but let's just not have these false uh, assumptions about what it means to be an A student, like showing up and handing in a mediocre paper. That's probably not it. Um, yeah, so I thought, you know, I can be transparent about what it means to be an A um, student. Um, and so finally, what if it's a group task? Because it's always hard when you put students in, in a group and there will always be, let's say, the older student who will pretend like he or she's the boss. And, or there will be the weaker students who will just let the other ones work hard and they will just, you know, lean back and relax and watch things happen. Um, so I put together a peer evaluation rubric and uh, thanks to Laura Schwartz, um, who talked about collaboration a, a few weeks ago, I added a couple more sections here. So basically they have to evaluate each other um, for instance, uh, keeping in touch with others because the group work doesn't necessarily take place only in the classroom. They probably have to meet outside the classroom. They have to collaborate um, either via Google Docs or um, texting or uh, some other way. So they, they will be grading each other, you know, who's, who in your group was doing everything above and beyond, satisfactory, or doing the bare minimum. And I do tell them that if your overall evaluation is that you were doing the bare minimum, it's probably going to be minus 25% on, uh, on the project. Uh, but they, they will tell you honestly if somebody was really not doing anything or doing much. Although, again, thanks to Google Docs, you can always see who's doing how much work because when you click on full history, you can see the students and there will be a color next to their names and you know the colors will show you who completed how much work. And I show this to the students, like, by the way, you know, we're using this tool and it's great because you can really show how much you did. Um, and so Laura Schwartz talked about these two questions. Um, would you work with these other students again? And would other, these other students work with you ever again? What do you think? And they really don't like this last question is what I found. It's like, what do you mean? Why would they not? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's an important part of it I learned and it's very helpful. So, um, so this is basically it. I hope that I gave you some ideas to, to take away and perhaps transform some of the assignments into more transparent uh, assignments. It's a lot of work. And it's a lot of effort because you really have to think, of, you, you have to type up everything that you used to just say, and now it's, you know, it's written down. And if you want to take the next step and create a video explaining all of it, then again, that's another 20 minutes of your time. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can even email me. Um, and uh, like Anna said, you guys will receive these slides and it has a lot of hyperlinks to Marianne Wilkelmes' uh, methodology and research in detail. Yes? So if you give your students um, a lot of guidance, but there's also a lot of prevention in it. And so the way you check to see if they're actually reading, you have them do a little checklist yes. or respond to your group. So does that add, does anybody complain about it? There's a lot more to do. And in the end, there's less of them to do because they know what to do. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but do you get any feedback from the students? Okay, is this too much? 
Um, because students compare classes, especially in our department, because we have like 700 students. <laughs> they do compare instructors, and well, there, I didn't have to do that much. And I'm like, well, you know, good for them. <laughs> but here, you do, so sorry. And, but I think towards the end, they, you know, they realize that it, it's for them. You know, I tell them, look, this is, you know, plus one assignment for me to grade yeah. or you look at, or, you know, to look at. So those journal entries, I mean, those are fairly easy to grade because I'm not grading their grammar and vocabulary there. I just really want to know, do you understand what you have to do? Did you really read something that I assigned? And that's, you know, that's fairly quick. But, yeah, I mean, it, it add on, adds on a little bit, but, um, but I think it, they can't really fake reading something, yeah. or they can just come to class and just see what the other people are doing, so that, you know, it helps them. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you again for coming, and please have some cheese and crackers and grapes. <laughs>